Monday, October 10th, 2011. This is InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Coming up later, we're going to do a video interview with Kurt Haskell from Michigan, the lawyer who survived, along with his wife, the underwear bombing of two Christmases ago. He has now been put on the witness list as the only witness for the reported underwear bomber, Mr. Mutalib. This is a big deal. He's being attacked in the Associated Press for pointing out that the U.S. government got the underwear bomber on the plane. The only problem is the AP doesn't mention the State Department admits they were ordered to by an unnamed U.S. intelligence agency. This is on C-SPAN. This is in the Detroit Free Press. This could end up being as big or bigger than Operation Fast and Furious, another false flag against our rights. Fast and Furious, a staged attack on the Second Amendment. The Christmas Day underwear bombing, an attack on the Fourth Amendment for the TSA rollout nationwide with the genital groping, the humiliation, the prisoner training, all of it. That is coming up tonight. Also, we've got extensive coverage. There's no way to make this show 30 minutes uh, here in its beta form. <laughs> it's always over an hour long. We've got a compilation of footage Rob Dew shot in Dallas along with the great folks at truthalliance.net. Uh, so you'll see some of the high def stuff versus some of the internet stuff they grabbed uh, off the web to show you what happened in Dallas at the uh, In the Fed event, trying to shift focus onto the real enemy. I want to commend all of those that were there. And we'll also show you some of the stuff that happened in San Antonio and then tomorrow night, some of the things that happened in Houston, but a great success. Hundreds of TV articles, stories about it reports uh, in mainstream and alternative news across the country. Very, very exciting. So that's coming up. And also uh, Matthew Medina of We Are Change San Antonio, um, good friend of the show, reporter for the show. He, a few weeks ago, was saying, oh, Occupy Wall Street are good folks. They're not controlled. But now it is moveon.org. They've taken them over. And uh, he'll tell you the story of what happened on that front, just like the Republicans tried to co-opt the Tea Party. The same thing's happening with the Democrats and Occupy Wall Street. That's why we're doing our In the Fed uh, movement. But I wanted to hit a few news articles that we really didn't get into enough on my radio show today. First off, Governor Brown has said that minors can't go to tanning beds. Uh, but it's okay for 12-year-olds to take the deadly Gardasil shot without their parents knowing. And that's the headline. New law lets 12-year-olds consent to preventative care for STDs. What the schools are doing is just telling them it's the law, they have to take it and not tell their parents. We showed you the video last week where they go to the door of parents and bang on it who are homeschooling parents and say it's the law, we're coming in to give them shots. The parents are so informed, they know it's all a con game, they just say bleep off and slam the door. <laughs> but uh, there is uh, that report. Uh, continuing with different hoaxes and frauds, we shift gears from Gardasil into Ron Paul. Ron Paul wins values voter poll ahead of Herman Cain. And they always say this is a very important um, poll uh, done by Christian conservatives mainly, and they take themselves very serious in this big, big important poll. But for the first time in the values voter poll, uh, the, the organizer of it has labeled his own poll irrelevant after Ron Paul wins. So why even, I guess I'm expecting next presidential cycle, uh, this group will not even operate then if suddenly uh, they're irrelevant uh, because uh, Ron Paul uh, has won that uh, coveted poll. You notice Ron Paul's been number one, number two, or number three in all the polls for six months. But they always say, oh, too bad he can't win. Herman Cain comes in second in Florida, and they say, well, he's the winner. And now he's the front runner, former head of the Federal Reserve in Kansas City a direct answer to Ron Paul. We'll just expose him like we've done Rick Perry and uh, Mitt Romney. And finally, Fast and Furious. You know, we've probably done 10, 15 reports just since InfoWars Nightly News kicked off uh, a little over a month ago uh, on uh, September 1st. And it is a modern day Iran-Contra where drugs are shipped into the U.S. and the rebels going after folks, uh, going after other cartels, uh, are, uh, are uh, given U.S. money and weapons. And that's exactly what's happening here. And, and, and now it's come out in federal court. The ATF directly shipped the guns into Mexico. And then only did the straw purchase stuff 
at gun stores to demonize the Second Amendment. So it's a win-win-win for the globalists. Knock out the drug cartels that aren't laundering their money through the private Federal Reserve banks. Uh, destabilize Mexico so they can talk about an SPP global financial merger as the SPP documents for the North American Union showed from the Banff Canada meeting uh, in 2007 that we cover in my film Endgame. And also the you know, best bite, little added cherry on top, uh, is they could also then demonize the Second Amendment. And even after the Justice Department got caught doing this to blame the Second Amendment and perjuring themselves, they're just going forward. So that's what you'd expect from the eight agencies involved, FBI, Coast Guard, DEA, Border Patrol, ATF, and other agencies all involved in bringing in $500 billion a year in drugs and all fighting hard to make sure smaller cartels don't cut in on the big banks' profits. Just like alcohol prohibition. The criminals lobby to make the stuff illegal so they make the higher profits. Am I saying everybody in the Border Patrol is bad? Certainly not. Everybody in the Coast Guard bad? Certainly not. Everybody in the FBI bad? Certainly not. Everybody in the ATF? No, not all bad. That's why they blew the whistle. The point is, this is another way to pick up the rocks and look at what's under it or under the floorboards. We've already seen about 5,000 cockroaches in our house, if America was a house. The lights are on. High noon, we're eating Sunday brunch, Sunday lunch, and there's roaches running around under the table, on the table. Can you imagine when you turn the lights off what's going on? And by that I mean, what, what is there we don't know about? None of us are safe under a system that's corrupt, even the people that are part of the corrupt system. This is out of control. This is out of control. Okay, um, that's basically it for now on the news. We've got a jam-packed transmission. We've got stuff, few things actually shake me up. The Kurt Haskell info coming up. I think we're going to send some of our reporters up in November off and on. We don't really have the funds, but if you continue to become PrisonPlanet.tv members and buy books, videos, whatever from uh, Infowars.com, support our sponsors, we may be able to. It's just that uh, I've got three or four great reporters in here that we can send places. It's just that it will exhaust our capital, but we're going to go ahead and probably just send reporters up to Detroit to cover this because this is as big as Fast and Furious, but hasn't gotten any attention. Okay, the first thing uh, I want to go to here is a compilation, again, of our video and others' video from the Dallas Occupy the Fed. Then we're going to come back uh, with the Matthew Medina. Then we're going to go to break and come back with the Kurt Haskell. Stay with us. This is Dallas, Friday. That's Friday. That's like 6 o'clock. Even more came. This is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm standing here with Sarah from Occupy Dallas. So, Sarah, what brings you guys to the Federal Reserve of all places? Um, we're going to be going around different points around the city over the next month or so. The Federal Reserve is a big is a big target. I mean, that's what's bringing down the whole the economy. It's bringing everybody down. And Alex Jones was going to be out here today, honestly, and we wanted to try to get as many people to hear about Occupy Dallas as what was going on. Federal Reserve is actually not federal. In fact, it says private property right over there. It does not say uh, government property. It says Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, private property, no trespassing. The Federal Reserve is a private bank. It's just, really? you know, yeah, really. It's not, it has private shareholders. It's a big banker club. And guess what, Rob? We're not in it. And they use their goon squad, the IRS, to steal money forcibly out of your paycheck that you and I earn when we go to work. They then loan that money back to the U.S. government at interest. And it's just totally criminal unconstitutional. The Republicans weren't able to co op the Tea Party. The Tea Party co opted the Republicans. And the Democrats aren't going to be able to co opt Occupy Wall Street. The American people are going up against the establishment, and it's a grassroots movement. And the mainstream corporate horror media, the dinosaur media, is losing all of its credibility as the people awaken. And the Fed! And the Fed!
We are not your slaves. It just boils down to that in the final equation. Um, this next piece of video is Matt Medina, who just a few weeks ago was calling me and saying, oh, no, the Occupy San Antonio folks, they're, they're, they're against the Federal Reserve. They're good people. Yeah, exactly, because the globalists, it was globalist groups, ad busters people, others, uh, Democratic operatives, who put out the idea of Occupy Wall Street through social media, knowing grassroots would show up because, yeah, Wall Street overall has been out of control. Then they come in and co-opt it. Michael Moore calling for communism, all this stuff. But then when I ran into Medina down there, uh, he's, and he says he's got video of this, too. They've been down there interviewing him. They're not even wanted now by Occupy San Antonio. And they're like, Ron Paul bad, Alex Jones bad, you know, basically the 99% we're going to get the 1%. Well, number one, that's not right. It's more like 4% has about 40, 50% of the wealth in this country or controls it and also pays around 40, 50% of the taxes. But Americans are 5% of the global population. A 7 billion, 300 million is about 5%. We have had half the wealth, but now we're losing it. It's freedom that brings wealth. There's plenty of wealth in African and Latin American and poor Asian countries, but they've got strong men in there who won't let anybody ever have any freedom so there's no wealth produced. And this is very elementary. The few countries in history, going back thousands of years that allowed freedom, had huge renaissance. Doesn't mean America's perfect. America's got a terrible record, but it's better than everybody else. See, that's the difference. We're kind of the top of the you-know-what pile here. So. All these people that say the American system is bad, oh, it's old-fashioned. Liberty and freedom and those ideas are the newest thing. The stuff we're going back to is what's 5,000 years old. Old-fashioned, gangster-run tyranny. All right, I'm, I'm digressing. Let's go to the Matt Medina report. This is important, and we'll come back and get to the Federal Reserve admitting they're private. Here it is. Well, here we are at the fake federal building, Region 11, and this is a substation of the Dallas number 11 fed and look at it the whole building looks like a post office the whole building says federal this federal that it's designed to masquerade to cloak itself we are identifying the real threat here ladies and gentlemen not nebulous capitalism of the free market and from day one i saw occupy wall street with the democratic party trying to infiltrate it uh trying to take it over trying to make it about raising taxes which is exactly what the federal reserve has called for they want new taxes not just a higher income tax they want a vat just like they want in europe same european central bank owned by the same people uh they want uh the sales taxes they want it all they want it now and so the first week or so of Occupy Wall Street down here in San Antonio, Matt Medina uh, of San Antonio, We Are Change, uh, radio host his own right, tried to reach out to him. They were listening. It was great. But once the Move On and Union people got there, and I'm not saying the Union folks are bad, but Move On is George Soros, big globalist, big Federal Reserve, you know, insider type. They were able to basically then say, you know, we don't want your Ron Paul signs. We don't want your in the Fed. That's bad. We just want a nebulous, you know, say that I guess we support Obama. So, 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 tell folks uh, what you experienced over those days. Yeah, and it's on the record. A lot of San Antonio activists have seen what I'm about to tell you. And to begin from the beginning, the first Occupy uh, San Antonio meetings, We Are Change San Antonio was there. We're having influence. They recognized us from YouTube, and you were legit. And at the same time, there were people, the local Rockefeller Foundation funded activists that we've had a run in before. Uh, as seen on our YouTube channel, the video Infowars is racist. The same Rockefeller Foundation Foundation people were trying to lead the the, the meetings for Occupy San. Antonio, and they're unsuccessful because the majority of the activists in those meetings were new activists. So they tried every meeting to show up at the beginning and, and ask to divide people by race and then by sex. And people were like, what? Why? What are you talking about? And then they, they come to us. They see us. And they're like, okay, well, these guys on YouTube, they got Infowar stickers, Infowar DVDs. And that was the thing. I had stacks of Infowar bumper stickers handing them out. Oh, you got Infowar stickers. So the Occupy people were, were mad open. The new activists were mad open to the Infowar information. So so when the first day of Occupy San Antonio rolls around, we got like 200 plus people. We created our own banner. We were handing out mad info. We, we protested the Federal Reserve. Everything was all good. The next day, one of my friends shows up to Occupy San Antonio 
and they tell him not to bring a Ron Paul sign. They tell him that Ron Paul sign is going to offend people. And he asked them, well, oh, hey, Occupy San Antonio, don't we support auditing the Federal Reserve? They said yes. He said, well, don't you think Ron Paul is our best man to do that? They said no. And that, that was the day after the march. So going back to the day of the march, we're hanging out. It's uh, myself and Cody Hess, who co-hosts Truth Exposed Radio uh, with myself. And Cody gets approached by MoveOn.org guy. And the guy's like, hey, uh, why don't you try and join MoveOn.org? It, it does the same thing this does. And Cody's like, wait, what? And Cody's like, you're on MoveOn.org? And Cody starts grilling about the Federal Reserve, the Jekyll Island, the international bankers, and the New World Order. The guy gets so frustrated, he gets mad, he gets pissed, he turns around and walks off. He should have crossed to a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> he should have did something, but he didn't give up. I think that guy was walking to everybody in the group. And that's to say, provocateurs started coming up, talking about communism, socialism. And that was the day of the march, October 6th. The next day, they tell us no Ron Paul signs, and then they take a vote. We don't want to go to the Federal Reserve when Alex Jones is going to be here. And that's what happened. And the people were telling me, hey, they started a whisper campaign said, hey, Matthew Medina's trying to take over this group. He's going to bring Alex Jones. He's handing out InfoWars stuff. And what happened, it had a backlash. Everybody's coming up to me saying, I don't understand why they're saying that about you. They're like, I don't understand why, why they're doing this. They're just creating division. I'm like, exactly. Well, look, now you see. Now you guys see. A lot of new activists have their minds right, they have their hearts right, but there is people, there are people coming in and manipulating that. So I'm just encouraging people. I mean, we experienced it. We saw the co-opting come in, and it's coming in. Uh, regarding in the Occupy movement, I've been a part of Occupy San Antonio. I was part of the, the media team, and I dropped out. When back I that up. My... That's fine. Back that up live. Back that up live. Uh, just to describe why uh, here on air you see that space. We're going to get to that in a minute. The cops showed up right then, and they came to me and said, hey, Alex, you got to go talk to the cops. So I told uh, Medina, hold on a minute. We're going to finish your interview. So we'll go back to the rest of his interview after the cops left. And then we'll come back and actually I'll set up the next clip with the cops. But let's go back to the rest of Medina breaking down what happened. Is people, there are people coming in and manipulating that. So I'm just encouraging people. I mean, we experienced it. We saw the co-opting come in, and it's coming in. Uh, regarding the Occupy movement, I've been a part of Occupy San Antonio. I was part of the, the media team, and I dropped out whenever they, were, they told my friend he couldn't have a Ron Paul sign. The Ron Paul sign offends people. So what I am seeing in the Occupy movement is uh, internal thought police policing going on. There's there's a, a, a unanimous kind of consensus that certain issues shouldn't be talked about, certain things shouldn't be said, and the activists in that police it. I was megaphoning satire uh, yesterday, and a gentleman said, no, we don't do that, we don't do that. So who is we? We the movement. We don't say certain things. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he got frustrated and walked off, and it happened again. And then we saw it happen later, and then last night I saw the news, uh, Adam Kokesh video of Occupy Washington, D.C. His previous video showed how the facilitators were provoking them to uh, go on private property and, and uh, go on the streets and block traffic, do illegal things, provoking the Occupy crowd. So uh, Kokesh has a new video where it's almost cult-like. The members get up and they're like, no, don't record it. And Adam Kokesh is like, this is in public. I can record y'all. And I've seen that kind of similar uh, behavior over here. It's almost cult-like in, in the activist community. It's like, don't say this, don't do that. This is what we're about. This is what you should be about. So as an activist, I just want to warn you all out there to, uh, about these tactics, about this co co-opting and subverting of standing up for yourself as an individual and saying what you want. You have your freedom of speech and no collective should tell you not to say what you want to say. And if you are part of a collective that does do that to you, that is a red flag that you should think for yourself and get out of that. And look, there are well-meaning people in the Occupy movement who have their hearts and their minds uh, on the right reasons to do it. And that's why I am there waking people up. That's why I go hand out DVDs. And that's why you should wake up as many people as you want. Because the New World Order is looking to co-op this mass movement. And it's up to us to wake the people up and steer them to the real direction and show them who the real criminals are, the New World International Banking Cartel. We're not going to stop. We are the future. We are the hope. We are the inspiration and motivation to all the people of the world. We are change! All right, folks, we're back. And uh, again, our microphones were shorting out. It was raining so hard. So that was a camera inside a bag shooting that. So that's why you hear that pitter patter. But I kind of think it's relaxing in a way. As long as the drought's been here in Central Texas, I'm like liking the sound of that rain hitting that camera. But again, Matt Medina, some of the other We Are Change folks called me like a week and a half ago and they go, Alex, we love you. But this Occupy Wall Street, no, they're good. They're good. And I was like, yeah, that's because. The operatives haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I'm talking about New York. The people are good, but the operatives are there. Like when they directed them out on the Brooklyn Bridge to block all that. This is all to give the idea of violence and everything to anybody that tries to protest Wall Street. 
and it's designed to make it be a Democratic Party thing. Well, the Democratic Party is the left wing, and you got the Republicans, the right wing, of the same bird. I mean, I'm here saying the emperor is wearing no clothes. Just like I'm here. L listen, 10 years ago, I would go out to Federal Reserve demonstrations. We didn't call it in the Fed. We called it abolish the Federal Reserve. We didn't have kind of the slick slogans that Ron Paul's come up with. And we thank him for that. You know, real simple stuff like in the Fed. What's another Ron Paul quote? Uh, in the empire of lies, you know, it's, a, it's treason to tell the truth. The point is, we would go out to these Federal Reserve, and you, and you see them on YouTube. People found them and uploaded them. We would go out and protest. And the cops would sit there and laugh at us when we said this is, this is not federal. Because these Federal Reserve buildings look like post offices or U.S. mints. I mean, Gothic Eagles, Big Seals, uh, Federal Reserve, you know, federal bold print. Uh, they say they're federal. Rush Limbaugh says it's federal. And that's why this next video is so important. The reason it's so important, they're so used to me looking for Google clips. They're actually trying to find the Ron Paul quote about, uh, about uh, in the empire of lies, telling the truth is a uh, treasonous act. Or what's the exact quote? It doesn't matter. It's on the back of one of his books I read. The point I'm getting at, good job trying to find it, though. The point I'm getting at is, the video clip you're about to see, and then we're going to go to break uh, and come back with Kurt Haskell. The video clip you're about to see is so important because it shows how perception works. I fall for the very same thing I'm always talking about. And I'll go ahead and give you the answer before we go to it because a lot of you won't catch it because I didn't catch it until the third time I saw it. Everything is about coloration in nature. You've got a lot of butterflies that have what looks like the eyes of a predator on its wings. You've got caterpillars that camouflage themselves like a predator. Uh, you've got a lot of this going on. And the private Federal Reserve is private. It took over the country 98 years ago. Its charter is up in two years. We could get rid of it then just by not renewing its charter. Amazing. Kind of like the Patriot Act's up every few years, we could get rid of it. That's one thing the establishment does is they always put a time limit on something. So if they want to get rid of something, they can. But we've come up to this point now of, of six big mega banks who met in secret a hundred years ago. They met in 1910. So I guess now a little over a hundred years ago. They met and, and they've bragged about it since then. JP Morgan the actual J.P. Morgan, not the J.P. Morgan of the day, but same company, uh, other, you know, the Rockefellers, you name it. They met at Jekyll Island, and they said, we'll call ourselves federal, and we'll also use our newspapers to attack the Federal Reserve and say we don't want it, and because we're so universally hated, being the robber barons that have done all this horrible stuff, the people will support it. But actually, the people didn't support it. They woke up to that scam, so they had a non-quorum vote. Three senators passed the Federal Reserve Act on December 23rd, right before Christmas, at almost midnight. So here we are, 90-plus years later, 98 years later, 100-plus years since their secret meeting at Jekyll Island to conceive this act, trying to get rid of it. And the cops all over the country, even in Dallas, I say 10 years ago, some of the cops were still laughing at me in Dallas because they had stuck signs up and put fences up saying private property. And I said, look, it looks like a federal building. It's got a big armored wall around it. Uh, and, and it says Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Texas. But look right there. They stuck these signs in the dirt, in the grass, saying this is private property. Keep off. Federal Reserve, private property. Keep off. And I was saying, don't you see the hoax? This is camouflaged. This is like a man dressed up like a woman or something trying to go in the women's bathroom. I mean, uh, this is like German soldiers trying to infiltrate New Jersey during World War II, dressed up like American soldiers trying to blow up ammo dumps. That actually happened. I'm like, this is fake. And the cops would go, oh, listen to this conspiracy theorist. Because the feds, and we've gotten these from good police that are awake, issue them every month training manuals and alerts saying the Federal Reserve is a federal agency. 
It's here to keep America safe. These dangerous kooks are coming to tell you it's not federal. Don't listen to them. So I'm there talking to the cops, saying, please, this is private. Look, it looks like a federal building. It says it's federal. It's not. And some were laughing. A few were nodding, saying, we agree with you. The head cop, you know, called me on the phone before and said, oh, I know, you know, about this, but... You know, I just want to make sure everything's going to be peaceful. So some of the cops were nodding their head and waving at me, but others were still laughing. Now, you go to San Antonio, and I'm around the corner interviewing Matt Medina out of the rain under the awnings there. And they come over to the interview, and they go, the cops are here. The cops are here. They want to talk to you. So I tell Medina, we probably should have left that in the clip. I didn't tell the guys to. And I go, hey, we got to go talk to the cops. Hold on a minute. So then I go over, and they tell me, yeah, the cops are saying it's private property. Get off. So I'm told these are cops. One of them was a San Antonio senior officer in his uniform, but the other guy he called captain was actually the head of Federal Reserve Security in San Antonio. But because people told me they were cops, I just automatically thought he was a cop until I went back and watched the video and then went and checked it. He's the head of security there. He said, if you don't like what's happening, you can call our head office in Dallas, that's the Federal Reserve for four states, Region 11 is based in Dallas. This was a satellite bank we were protesting. First the main bank, then the Houston bank, then the San Antonio bank. The three branches here, but the, but the head one's Dallas for four state area. And here I was, sh see the video shot, go home, think they're cops, and it wasn't until I aired the video on the radio that I thought, wait a minute, that guy may be Federal Reserve. Then I went and researched it this morning, he was Federal Reserve. So see how even smart people who aren't totally paying attention because you're busy and they keep you busy, it looks like a federal building. It says federal. It's got a big American Eagle seal on it. We get fooled by this stuff. We get fooled by the packaging. So I ran the headline. It's a very popular video. Cops admit Federal Reserve is private. The truth was I go to the cop, the San Antonio cop in, in the clip coming up, you know, in his uniform, uh, the officer, and I say to him, hey, I heard you're saying this is private. You know it's private? And he goes, talk to Captain such and such, who's the Federal Reserve guy. And he goes, no, no, we're private. Please leave. Call our head office in Dallas if you want. And I walk off thinking, because I'm told it's cops, that it's cops till I think about it. But we actually had the head of security for the Federal Reserve, and then it was private. And some people, my final point is this, some people think that well, Alex, big deal. So they admit it's private. We all know that. We don't all know that. The San Antonio cop, who's a senior cop, I forget, I didn't, is he like a lieutenant or something? You can look at his uniform when it comes up. The guy they sent out there on Sunday afternoon, he said, I don't know. And as soon as he saw the guy admit, yeah, we're private, please get out of here, see the cop starts smiling. I'm going, hey, you ought to criminally investigate this. And the cop's smiling more, because for all these years, he's been told this is federal. And I'm going, look how it looks like a federal building. Look at the seals. Look at the names. And as a cop, he's going, yeah, this is weird. The head of security is admitting this is private. This is the first time he's hearing the truth. And it's a put the sun sunglasses on, they live moment, or a take the red pill moment, or a pull the curtain back and Wizard of Oz moment. And that's all I'm asking you to do. I'm not going to be able to show you the truth in the world. We all have our own perspectives. We all are limited. But you individually can decide to take the glasses off. And I'll, or put them on actually, or take the red pill or, or pull the curtain back. I know that you are not seeing the full reality. None of us are. So all I'm asking is put the sunglasses on, take the red pill, pull back the curtain, wake up, Wake up from your sleep, whatever you want to call it. Here's this video clip of uh, the head of security for the Federal Reserve uh, admitting that it is a private organization and please get off their private property. And then we'll go to break and come back with bombshell info, and I mean bombshell with Kurt Askell. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Stay with us. Uh, hey, guys, how you doing? I'm Alex Jones. Good, how you doing? Good, good. Uh, can you just repeat you're saying this is private property? Uh, I don't know. This is the captain now. Sure, sure. Go ahead, yes, sir. sir. I, this is the property of the Federal Reserve right here. I just private, need to go though. It's back. not federal, right? Yeah, private property. 
Okay. I need you to go back to the public street. The I public think, side. you know what, it is private property. I think you're right. We will get off. You're absolutely right. Let me just ask you this one question, and, and, and I'm going to ask everybody to move off the private property that's all reserved. <laughs> Doesn't this look like a post office, and it's got federal seals on it, it says federal reserve? It's like counterfeiting or something. It'd be like if people opened up a... No, the Fed doesn't counterfeit, do they? I think that's something police ought to investigate. Yeah, no, really. Y'all I mean, just down the road. Doesn't this kind of look weird? It's a federal building, but it's not federal. I mentioned that to him. They said... Oh, oh sir, I'm sorry. What did you say? It's not a federal building. building. It's not a federal building. No, sir. It's a Ten years ago, building. cops were laughing about down. that. However, I'm excited you however, know. However, you're welcome to call our public affairs or call our head office in Dallas and speak with them. No, sir, you've been super nice. You're right. We Some people thought it was like a park because it looked like a post office. You're right. Property, we better get off. We better go. Hey guys, well they do get our tax money and they do control everything. They enslave us. I mean, sure they are the slave masters, but see that you heard the police officer. He's right. This is private property, so we want our private property. Now this it's private property of a mafia, of a criminal cartel. But nevertheless, it's their private property for now, and until they're indicted and in prison, we won't. And until you know, we finally get the audit and the Congress raids raid all the material, we're gonna we're gonna respect their private property until then. So let's get off the private property of the Federal Reserve right now. Come on, everybody! Come on, let's go! Let's get off the private property. I got that whole conversation. If you want to email, this is out here tonight. This beautiful weather. Here protecting our First Amendment, and I wonder how many of these police officers can read on the sign Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Federal, Federal, but right here says private property. Does that sound like fraud to you? Private property, Federal Reserve? Can't you investigate it? There's the criminals right there. Yeah! We need to have these people, show the cops do. We need to have these people. Officers, I have a question for you. You're here guarding the uh, private offshore Rothschild Bank, the Federal Reserve, from evil Americans. Yeah, evil, evil Americans. I know you get the Homeland Security Report saying those that don't like the Federal Reserve are evil. I've read the Homeland Security Report until they tell cops the Federal Reserve is federal and that we're raving lunatics. Really, their charter is private. Right there, private property. No trespassing. Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. It doesn't say federal zone, federal property, stay off slaves. It says private property, no trespassing. Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is. And it's not in a president. Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight. Well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election. The elite are using Obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the North American Union by stealth, launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. You've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right? No, everything's not going to be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now. 
especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception, the truth strikes back. Get your copy of the Obama deception today at infowars.com or download it in super high quality at prisonplanet.tv. And we are back. It is InfoWars Nightly News, this special Columbus Day transmission. I hope all of you are having a good and safe holiday with your family. We did not take off today because uh, the news never sleeps. Now, this next story is incredible. Uh, we'll put up on screen the Chicago Tribune. It's also in other papers uh, across the country. And the Chicago Tribune is reporting lawyer may testify for defense in terror case and that's actually the Associated Press uh, posted at the Chicago Tribune, a Michigan attorney who claims the government had a role in the attempted bombing of the Detroit-bound plane could be called as a witness for the defense. And it goes on to say that the underwear bomber, Umar Farouk Abdul Matalib, may call Kurt Haskell, who was a passenger on the Northwest Airlines Flight 253 from Amsterdam to Detroit on Christmas Day 2009. Haskell's name was disclosed in court Thursday by attorney Chambers, an attorney who was assisting the reported underwear bomber. Now, let's, let's be clear here, ladies and gentlemen. Kurt Haskell, a month and a half before, in congressional sworn testimony, the Undersecretary of State Kennedy, a month and a half before, Kennedy confirmed what Kurt Haskell said he witnessed in the Amsterdam airport. A month and a half before, right off the plane, Kurt Haskell said he saw the sharp-dressed man get him on the plane, argue with the people at the uh, final boarding area, and get him on without the passport. Later, we learn that the State Department was pressured by a, quote, unnamed agency. This is on record. C-SPAN, Detroit Free Press, you name it, to put him on the plane and to get him that visa. So this is basically what we're dealing with here. So uh, Kurt Haskell is not somebody who is claiming there's a government role. From day one, he said shenanigans are going on. It should be investigated. And now here to break down the incredible development, like out of a Hollywood movie. Uh, in fact, they wouldn't put it in a movie. It's too incredible that, that the uh, reported underwear bomber, the guy who says he did it, would now say that he's going to call Kurt Haskell. We'll get into the jury selection so much more with Kurt Haskell today. Kurt, thank you for joining us. Sure. Glad to be back. Now, that was a basic breakdown. In the 10 minutes we've now got with you, uh, I would like you to just go over what it was like to hear that he's calling you as a witness. And I know you've been going to the jury selection and other parts of the trial, and you've also, uh, on your blog, uh, talked about the Associated Press quoting you out of context. So let's cover it all. All right. Yeah. Um, I had a trial of my own. I was doing Thursday morning. And then I, when that finished, it was supposed to finish around 1. I was going to head over to federal court, which was about three or four blocks away from where I was at, to watch the final jury selection. And this was on Thursday last week, so just a few days ago. And just as my trial was ending around one o'clock, I got a text from my brother that said, I hear you're testifying at the underwear bomber trial. And this was news to me. So I gave him a call as soon as I got out of my trial. And uh, he said he heard on the radio. Now, mind you, he's in Florida. He lives in Florida. He's not local here at all. So this was national radio. And he said he heard on the radio that uh, standby attorney Chambers had indicated in court today that I'd be testifying. So, as I said, this was big news to me. So I headed over to uh, the federal courthouse to try and talk to Anthony Chambers. And I actually ran into him outside the courthouse. And I said, hey, what's going on? I hear something was said about me this morning in court. I wasn't there. And he said, yeah, uh, Umar said this morning that he wants attorney Haskell to be his only witness in the case. So it's pretty shocking to me, actually. You know, I, I didn't think that Umar, if he was representing himself, would call me as a witness. Now, I knew that Anthony Chambers would if he was ever appointed uh, official attorney. He's only standby right now. So the fact that Umar himself called me, uh, it's really shocking to me. Uh, 
I, I'm just very, very, very surprised at it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, it's so ironic. I mean, truth is almost stranger than fiction here. We have the underwear bomber representing himself, having me, the only witness, testify in this case. Remember, he's being charged with attempting to murder me and 289 other people. But how ironic is it that now I'm on the stand to testify on his behalf to save him from a life sentence in prison? Uh, you, you couldn't make something like this up, even. It's extremely bizarre. Um, that being said, the uh, two days before this, I was in court watching the uh, prospective jurors get questioned and how this works. Uh, the judge asked each juror some questions and then the prosecutor asked some questions and then the defense attorney. And, you know, I kept seeing the same questions come up from the judge and from standby attorney chambers for the defense. And there were basically two questions, slightly varied, but the first one was, do you think after you hear all the evidence, you'll be able to determine whether the defendant actually possessed a bomb or an explosive device? And the second question that was repeated often was, do you realize that the media doesn't always tell the truth? So I thought those two questions were pretty telling to me. Uh, you know, and as I'm sitting there with all these members of the press thinking they're going to report these in their articles, I even talked to two reporters, one from readers and one from CNN saying, you know, are you guys catching on to what's going on here that what I've been telling you for two years now is actually true? And both of them kind of shook their heads agreeing with me. But do we have those statements or those questions or any significance in any media story from that day? Not at all. The only place that even appeared was in uh, a, a continuing blog the Free Press had that day on freep.com. And it was just a little blurb. They had someone at the courthouse giving continual updates. And what it said was the media is really taking a beating here today or something like that. The only place this was even scratched upon at all, because obviously, you know, if the media reports that these questions keep coming up, the next question is why? And the answer is very obvious. It's what I've been saying all along. Uh, Umar was placed on this plane intentionally by an undercover U.S. intelligence uh, agent with a defective bomb. That's the real story. It's the story the press is trying very hard to cover up, and uh, it, it doesn't want it to get out. It's too explosive. Um, now, that being said, Umar had a couple of outbursts at the hearing on October 4th saying that the U.S. is a cancer and... Um, uh, I forget exactly. It's on my blog if you want to see the exact word. He was saying that Zarqawi wasn't dead and the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Anwar al Alaki isn't dead. He's alive, something like that. And um, the AP, an AP reporter asked me about that after the hearing. What he says, what do you, what do you make out of these outbursts? And I said, well, you know, I saw Umar before we boarded. He didn't make a peep. I saw him when he lit his fake bomb on the plane and his crotch was burning and he didn't make a sound. And I've seen him here several times in court and he's always quiet and, you know, doesn't say much. And this is totally out of character. So what the AP reported was um, Haskell says this is out of character for Umar. Um, you know, when he lit his bomb, he didn't make a peep. Well, I read that article and it left out two important things that I thought. One, that I saw him before we boarded, and two, that I said he lit a fake bomb. So you can see how the media was twisting my statements back on Tuesday. Yeah, it's you turning them into false statements, but, but uh, you told me today on the radio, the AP reporter wasn't done there. I mean, he wants to continue to misrepresent what you're saying. Right. And after this bombshell on Thursday, where Umar indicated in court that he's calling me as his only witness, I got a call from the same reporter, Ed White of the AP. And you can see his name attached to many of these articles. And I said, look, Ed, before I talk to you again, you know, I read your article Tuesday. I'm not very happy with it. You left out two important details. And I said, I'm only going to agree to talk to you 
if you put in your article word for word what I say and don't twist it around. Well, this time he put in that I gave him uh, a wild story or something like that, a wild theory on what happened. So uh, based on that, I'm now done with the mainstream media with a couple very small exceptions, one being Fox News and one being another reporter uh, named Vicki Thomas. I'm not sure who she's with, but uh, she's reported fairly uh, on what I've indicated. So that's going to be about it for the mainstream media. For me, I'm finished with them. They have an agenda here, especially with the trial starting and with me, with me testifying on behalf of the defense. I'm sure they're, they'd love to twist my words around to paint me as some lunatic. It's not going to happen. I'm not talking to them anymore. So, but again, you know, two things are happening with the media. They're not reporting on this or they're reporting inaccurately, leaving out things or twisting things around. We can see a clear agenda here by the media. Well, that's right. If this was just a lone a nut underwear bomber and you were some guy, you know, who had a weird theory, they would be, you know, just moving forward. Uh, but the fact that there's this clear agenda and there's so much deception and you've been proven credible over and over again while they've been proven uncredible and that they're engaged in deception. Uh, you pointed out today on the radio that the same prosecutor they've got in another terrorism case lost the appeal uh, because they had withheld evidence. You were telling me weeks ago you were at the early trial and that they'd withheld evidence for a year and a half and that now his standby lawyer was saying, where's the evidence? And his standby lawyer... Uh, said yes uh, when you went to visit with him to put words in your mouth you can repeat it but I mean you said on the radio that uh, or to repeat your words that you went to the standby lawyer and he's and you're like have you heard of me and he goes yeah we're basing our case you know on your research and we think it's a case of entrapment I mean this is amazing and I brought up to you on the radio today and I want you to speak to this briefly you know I said how do you parallel this with Fast and Furious and you really zeroed in on the core of it in both events Fast and Furious has meant to target our Second Amendment and blame what's happening in Mexico on the Second Amendment. And it's the government shipping guns into Mexico, caught red-handed now, and caught perjuring themselves, same Justice Department. And in the case of the underwear bomber, it's meant to roll out the naked body scanners and the groping and the rest of it. I mean, this is incredible. Yeah, to take away our Fourth Amendment rights, to be free of uh, illegal searches and seizures. Yeah, I, I certainly see a parallel there. Although, again, I don't know that much about the Fast and Furious case, but from what I've seen, that's what I'm taking out of it, um, that this was some sort of an attempt to restrict our Second Amendment rights. Obviously, th this case, the underwear bomber, was definitely an attempt to take away our Fourth Amendment rights, um, to roll out the naked, bo naked body scanners. Well, actually, I'm going to touch on that um, for a second, too. If we go back to December 09, there were some naked body scanners in the airports, but there were very, very few. And actually, there was already a bill that had passed the House of Representatives. Um, and the bill was to restrict body scanners to only secondary screening in airports, meaning only if you set off the metal detector first would you have to go through a naked body scanner. It had already passed the House of Representatives. It was waiting to be voted on in the Senate when this event happened on Christmas Day or 9. Despite that fact, in November 2009, a month before the underwear bomber, the TSA ordered 150 new body scanning machines. So I think that's pretty telling. That, you know, if you go back in history and look at what was going on with these body scanning machines at that time. Obviously, since this attack, well, now they're everywhere, not only in airports, now they're talking about putting them uh, where in buses, trains, probably shopping sports. malls, and they've announced even the small airports today are going to get hundreds of them. Billions of dollars uh, for the, these companies that the former head, who was the current head at the time, Mr. Chertoff, consults for and makes makes millions of dollars from. It's just it's just incredibly obvious that the bill had passed to restrict them and to cut into that business model. It was going into the Senate to be completely passed. Had the votes. The thousands of machines are ordered a year before. They're about to roll into the airports in January. You're in December. And magically, the underwear bomber's gotten on the plane by the U.S. government. They get him the, the credentials he needs, get him on board. You come out and tell this wild story that somebody with security credentials got him on. Then later it's confirmed. I want to close with this.
and you wouldn't give me your take on it today, and I don't blame you because you don't want them to pigeonhole you. You're just following the facts, like they would say in Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. But you have now, a year and a half into this, on my show just a few weeks ago, here on the TV show, you know, said clearly this is an inside false flag, the evidence is all there. And they're going to dredge all that up, and they're already doing it. Even when you don't, you know, tell the AP something, they twist it into that. When, when you're stating facts here, and I really, I guess off air I might ask you, uh, but I really do want to know your insider view, surviving the attack, following it for almost two years. I want to know the first thing that went through your mind when you found out that the reported underwear bomber was saying that you were going to be his only witness. What was the first thing that went through my mind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, I can't believe it. That was <laughs> That was it. I, I, it came out of left field because I never, ever thought the underwear bomber himself would call me as a witness. I thought Anthony Chambers would if he got the chance, but again, he doesn't have authority to do that. So what are the motives? What are the motives? What could be going on? I know it's speculation, but come on. I, I don't think I can go there. I don't, I don't think I can go. I don't know that I even know the answer, and I don't really want to speculate. You know, I, obviously, I've never talked to Umar. I've never met him. You know, I, I don't know. To get an honest answer, I, I probably could give you an answer by talking to Umar for about two minutes, but I never have. So I, I would just be speculating. You know, I, I have to be careful what I say right now because obviously the prosecution is going to try and paint me as a lunatic. Hey, why doesn't Umar? Why, I mean, if he's already fired his lawyers and standby lawyers. Would it be the first time in history that the uh, reported person carrying out the crime could hire one of his victims as his lawyer? Hire me as his lawyer? Yeah, he could. I mean, he's already talking about you being his only witness, and you're a lawyer there in that area. He could actually have you as his lawyer. Let's put that idea out here. Would you represent the underwear bomber? Oh. I don't even think I could answer that. I don't think anyone would. Well, a couple things. I don't know that they would, Judge Edmonds would even let me do that. But number two, if you're an attorney, you can't be one of the main witnesses in the case. And obviously, I'm the only witness. So that it would be detrimental to Umar's case because I wouldn't be able to be a witness. Sure, sure. I was just thinking of, of the bizarreness of this, that he doesn't have a lawyer but, and, and, and he's been reportedly saying he did it, but now he's getting angry. You know, clearly when he heard that Amor al Alaki, the CIA admitted lackey who hangs out and has dinners at the Pentagon, when he heard that he had been killed for the fifth time, by the way, but they never retracted the last four, that probably freaked him out because that was his supposed handler. And I think that, I mean, if you've, if you've got to speculate, that's the first point we look at that he had an outburst on that subject, said he wasn't really dead, and now I think this might have been a shot across their bow, uh, that he's not going to stay on the reservation unless they make some deal with him. I know this, because following past patsies, no matter what deals he thinks he makes with them, he has no hope, but coming out like Lee Harvey Oswald and saying, I'm a patsy, I didn't do this, and, 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 and then staying alive, Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't do that. I don't really know what Umar's thinking. Uh, I I couldn't tell you, really. Um, even these outbursts in court, I don't know what to make out of it. A lot of people are speculating, but I hate to even guess. It just seems so out of character. Well, I, I hate to say out of character because he did try to blow up a plane, but it seems out of character from every time I've seen him. You know, he just seems real quiet and meek. Maybe yeah, you said, game. well, I mean, the way some have described him was disheveled, drugged, whatever. Going back, though, and, and, and I want to give you the final two minutes with any other points you want to make, uh, Kurt, and we really appreciate you coming and joining us here. This is just amazing uh, information. And, of course, it's uh, unfiltered here, and you know, everything you say is transmitted out to the people. Uh, what do you think the prosecutors are thinking? Uh, I mean, they're there. They know what you know. They're witnessing all of this. And, I, you know, I asked you last time you were on, have you ever confronted them in the hallway and said, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, they've got to know what you know. Oh, Alex, they know everything. There's no question about it. You know, what, what's kind of strange about this, too, 
obviously I've been stating all along that I was a witness to one of the accomplices of the underwear bomber. This man should be one of the most wanted men in the world. Uh, they've never tried to have me identify the person. Not only that, the prosecutors have never talked to me ever, not once. Now, you, don't you think they want me as a witness in their case um, to prosecute the underwear bomber or help with the accomplice? They've never called me even once. Um, what do I think about uh, what they're thinking about me testifying? I think they're scared out of their minds. I think they're trying to devise a way to deal with me. And they're probably digging into all kinds of background information on me, trying to find something to paint me as a lunatic or a liar, a cheat, something like that. But they're, they're panicking. They, were, they thought if Umar was representing himself that I wouldn't be testifying. They would not call me as a witness, and neither would Umar. I, I, I think this announcement is causing a lot of problems for them. Well, they've got a big problem, to put it lightly. The standby lawyers have told you that their case is based on what you saw and that they believe it is entrapment and a setup. Of course it is. Classic, classic Patsy setup, just textbook. Uh, you've got now, obviously, uh, uh, Mutalib is watching you on TV, reading about you in his jail cell because he has access to that, uh, and is now beginning to think. And uh, let me tell you, they are panicking, and I'm worried he's going to have a heart attack or die or slip on the soap or whatever or get uh, uh, in prison. I'm worried about you, but we've already talked about that on the radio. Uh, sir, I, I really look forward to interviewing you a lot more as this unfolds. Uh, because here at InfoWars and, and InfoWars Nightly News, you're going to have uh, a place where you're not going to be uh, censored on screen during the interview. We've had uh, your uh, website up, but for the visually impaired, uh, it, it, it would probably be good if you uh, told folks verbally uh, your website. And then I want to give you about two minutes to make any final uh, comments that you think are important and pertinent. Sure. Haskellfamily.blogspot.com. For any of you that are interested, uh, if you don't know the full story, go back to Christmas Day 2009 and read forward. Um, you know, you can see all the, the blog posts I've done about this. I've probably done 30 maybe, or maybe more, I don't know. Um, the trial starts tomorrow. We haven't actually talked about that. The opening arguments start tomorrow at 9. The Underwear Bomber has said that standby attorney Chambers will be making his opening statement. So uh, I can't... I, I'm actually looking very much forward to it. I'm going to be down there unless they kick me out. Now, I'm, I may get kicked out since I'm a potential witness, but uh, Lori and I are go both going down there tomorrow. We'll be there all day uh, until court's finished. Uh, I can't wait. I expect it to be a media circus, but don't expect to see me making too many statements in the media for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I think they're very much against me, and I think talking to them will just... Uh, hurt my credibility. So, you know, stay tuned. There's going to be a lot happening from this. The trial is expected to take a month. Uh, I'm not expected to be called until the very end. So I probably won't be testifying until uh, maybe the first week of November. And, uh, you know, I'll be glad to come back here and give you updates, Alex, whenever I can. I expect there to be a lot, uh, a lot of things going on at the trial and a lot of things I can probably point out, you know, that that are happening that aren't true. I, that's what I would expect, though. You know, I would expect that there would be uh, quite a few anomalies in the prosecution's case. Incredibly amazing, just just off the charts bizarre. Uh, and I can't wait to see the truth come out because already so much of the truth has come out because you were in that airport and saw them get him on the plane and then it came out that indeed the government was ordered, the State Department by an unnamed agency, to help get him on that plane to try to kill you and your wife and the rest of those passengers, but you survived by the grace of God, and you're here now. And the assailant, the admitted assailant in his own words, for whatever reason, is now calling you. This is the stuff of Hollywood movies and legend, buddy. It's real world. It's not fiction. Kurt Haskell, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks, Alex. Glad to be on anytime. Thank you, sir. Well, wow, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. It is so important to pray for that guy and to also go to his website, uh, get that information and get it out to everybody you know. Because this is just like Fast and Furious. This is another false flag staged event. I've analyzed it 
I've been studying this for 17 years. As you know, this is my specialty. And it has got the fingerprints of a staged event all over it. It's been confirmed to be one. And we can bring these criminals to justice if you get this information out to everybody. Also, you know, we post this first and stream it first to PrisonPlanet.tv and the great members there. If you believe in this information, please subscribe. But then we post it to the YouTube channel. Uh, and also to the four winds, where tens of millions a month watch this information. If you believe in this information, become a Prison Planet TV subscriber. See all my films in super high quality. My book, Paul Watson's book, uh, eight and a half years of material at Prison Planet TV. You can also watch the show live uh, when we first air it at seven o'clock central each and every weeknight. And uh, again, we will continue, Lord willing, to be here and cover the incredible underwear Christmas Day bombing trial as we approach the two-year anniversary. I'm Alex Jones signing off from the front lines of the Info War. Great job to the crew.